Hello, I'm Hendrik Tolman. I work for the National Weather Service, which is part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and I work there as the senior advisor for our model. I'm going to talk to you today about weather forecast innovation. In order to do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the National Weather Service and what we're doing. And then I'm going to talk about some fields of innovation that we're working on. Innovation is absolutely essential for an organization like ours that is based on science and technology just to stay on top of our game. There are three types of innovation I want to talk about. The first one is about how we work together. The second one is how we work with the American public, our clients. And the third one is how we use new technology and new science in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So why is this important for you? I'll give you one example of these three fields. About a year or more ago, if you wanted to run our global weather model on your own computer, then you would basically need a team of a few people and a few months. And you might even have to buy our type of supercomputer to be able to do that. We did a lot of software engineering lately. And as of March of 2020, it is now possible for you on your own in one day to install this software on pretty much any computer you want. This allows us now to work much closer with you uh, on modeling than we could do even a year ago. So what does the National Weather Service do? The National Weather Service produces one and a half million forecasts each day and some 50,000 warnings for severe weather. In order to be able to do that, we gather more than 6 billion observations each day and we use big supercomputers to make products out of these observations and to run models to create a projection of the weather in the future. With that, we are very much a science-based organization and we are considered one of the most science-based and objective parts of the US government, of which we are really proud. You probably deal with what we are doing almost every day. You probably have looked uh, in the last few days whether you needed an umbrella or a raincoat or you have looked at what you're going to do over the weekend based on what the weather is going to do. No matter where you get that information from, whether it's from a television station or from an app, chances are that most of that information actually came originally from the National Weather Service. Uh, and it's not just you who are looking at this. We have a big impact on significant parts of the economy. Uh, for instance, think about a transportation sector, a ship at sea, a plane in the air, a truck on the road, all of these uh, need our weather forecast to be safe and to be efficient. Now, you may think that that is our main focus of the work we're doing. However, our main mission is that of protecting life and property. And that means that we are more focused even on extreme weather. Let me give you an example of how important that is. Take a look at this graphic. This graphic shows you the 16 events that occurred in the first nine months of this year, 2020, that all created more than a billion dollar in damages. If you look closely at this, you see three hurricanes that made landfall in the Atlantic Basin. You see fire events on the West Coast for which we created a specific uh, fire weather forecasts. You see a bunch of tornado events and you see a lot of other severe weather events. This is our main mission focus, to protect life and property with these events. So making a little bit of a, a change of pace here, how do we do this? Our forecasters are the ones who make these forecasts and these warnings. The observations we make and the models we run are just some of the tools they use to do that. And we've done a lot of innovation with these tools. We've done a lot of innovation in observations and in modeling but that has been gone on for at least 20 or 30 years. So I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about innovations that have happened much more recently. Like I said before, the way we work together, uh, the way we work with you, our customers, and how we use artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the first of these topics, uh, let me call that the anthropology of modeling. In the 1990s, when I started working for the National Weather Service, we had the biggest computer or one of the biggest computers in the world, and we had a very dedicated and a very uh, high quality team of people inside of our weather service. So naturally, we did most of the development of our tools, our computer models ourselves. Now fast forward, uh, look to the 2020s. 
there is so much more capability now available outside of the National Weather Service in computing power, in people, in teams, that it would be stupid for us if we do not uh, leverage all this other uh, capability. So we really want to work with a team inside of NOAA, inside of the government, and with academia and industry. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, I gave you already an example of how we treat our software differently. We went from using software that is really intended for use in-house to having a community approach to using software. We call this the unified forecast system. This unified forecast system allows us to do research and operations with exactly the same software and research within NOAA and with the broader community also with exactly the same software. That allows us to more rapidly get innovations into operations and it allows us to do more targeted research to help operations. With that, we've also started to develop an Earth Prediction Innovation Center. This Earth Prediction Innovation Center, or EPIC, uh, will be developed so that we can more effectively work between operations and research and between the government, academia, and industry. Uh, then the final part of that is what does this mean for you and what does it mean for me? For us, it means that we need different skill sets in our organization. We don't just need a uh, oceanographer or a meteorologist, we need uh, also computer scientists and people who know how to work in teams. Because we cannot work alone anymore because ocean, atmosphere, ice, and all these different parts of uh, the environment all work together. What does it mean for you? It means that you don't have to be a scientist who is specialized in oceanography, meteorology, or an other physical science part. No, we also need people that can uh, do computer science and that are good at doing things like project management and team management. So there are completely different opportunities now for you to work in the weather service. The second innovation is about how we work with uh, our customers. This is all about social and behavioral sciences. As, early, as late as the mid 1990s, we started uh, creating, uh, realizing that uh, it was not just uh, our forecast that had value, but it was the value of the decisions that you are making based on our forecast that is more important even than the forecast itself. So when just under a decade ago, we reorganized the National Weather Service, we shifted our focus from making a forecast to going that last mile to be able for you to make the right decisions based on our forecast. This is all about social and behavioral sciences. In order to do that, we started something called the Weather Ready Nation program. This program is exactly intended to do what it's called. It is intended to make you more ready to deal with weather events so that when these events occur, you will make the right decisions to deal with it. So um, what does that mean for, uh, for us internally? It means that we use science, uh, social and behavioral sciences uh, to get more output and more relevant output out of our models. Uh, products that are more easily to understand by the public. It also helps us to work better internally as teams, but it goes well beyond that. Let me show you, show you that with this picture. This picture shows you a flooded road and a road sign next to it. The text on the road sign, the color of it, the size of it are not there by accident. They are products of active research in social and behavioral sciences. So that means that with this simple sign, it looks simple, we actually are much more efficient uh, in making sure that you make the right decision and do not get in trouble when you run into or up to a flooded road. So what does this mean for us? For us, it means just like with uh, the first innovation that we need a more diverse workshop, a workforce. We need uh, also people with social and behavioral science skills inside of our organization. What does it mean for you? It means that if you are in the field of social and behavioral sciences, that weather issues and having people make the right decisions 
in extreme weather is a very interesting field to research. You can do it on your own or you can do that with us to make sure that our messaging gets better. It can even means that if you're not into physical sciences like oceanography and, and, and meteorology, there still may be a job for you in the National Weather Service. So finally, I want to talk about the innovation of introducing, introducing artificial intelligence and machine learning into our operations. Now, I could talk for a long time about all the different things artificial intelligence and machine learning can do. But instead of that, I think it's more efficient to talk about some challenges that we think we have in which we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning. One of these challenges is the data challenge. We create more and more data. It can be observations or it can be output for computer models. We simply do not have enough eyes to look at that to get all the information out of that. Uh, and quite frankly, the volume of the data is so big that an individual person can really not get to the bottom of all the information in it. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us to more effectively get the information out of our observations and out of our models. And with this more effective uh, uh, assessing of what uh, the information that is in there, we can do better uh, uh, forecasts and we can do better decision support uh, to our customers. Another challenge that we have is the model resolution challenge. Uh, when I uh, started working for the weather service and for the first 20 or so years of my career, every two years, the size of a computer would roughly double without us even having to pay more money for a computer. That meant that a lot of the innovations we made in our modeling were based on the fact that we could, could build bigger and more complex models as time went by without having to pay more for the computer. The last few years, this growing of the computer for the same cost is no longer existent. There are many reasons for that, but one interesting reason for that is that we can build bigger computers, but that we have a hard time finding the amount of uh, electricity we need to run and to cool these computers. This means that we need to be smarter on how to build bigger and better computer models. Artificial intelligence can help us to more optimally uh, uh, tune our models and get better results out of them that way. But more importantly, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us to make cheap emulators for expensive pieces of our models. That way, we can run our models much more efficiently, so we can run our models on smaller computers, or we can still run bigger models on the computers that we have. A final challenge that we see is what we call the physics challenge, which is really closely related to the data challenge. Uh, there is so much information in the observations that the human mind cannot get out of there, but machine learning and artificial intelligence may be able to teach us more about how the environment works, help us understand and learn about what is important in the atmosphere and what we need for forecasts. Understanding the atmosphere, the ocean, ice, and other pieces of the environment better will then allow us to make better models that are more accurate without making them necessarily much bigger. So all these three challenges uh, have uh, very clear potential solutions in artificial intelligence and in machine learning. And in some ways, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, may also be able to become an additional tool for our forecasters and possibly, uh, some people say, even replace our computer models. Personally, my opinion is that artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be great tools for our forecasters, but I do not see uh, these new fields replace our modeling for the following reasons. We have an enormous amount of data that we have. Artificial intelligence is really good to go inside the data and figure out what's going on there. So artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us do a day-to-day -day forecast pretty well. But this enormous data amount that we have, the severe weather and our warnings are on the outside of that data cloud. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is not necessarily that good at getting information on the outside of your data cloud. And for that reason, I believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be really important for the forecasters, but not replace modeling. So that leads me to the end of the three innovations that I wanted to talk about. And now I want to leave you with some philosophical thoughts and a challenge. We introduced models almost 70 years ago to the forecasters. And in the first decades that we had models, 
Our forecasters, a lot of them thought that was just a fad that wouldn't help them too much. Over the last 30 years or so, the improvements in our forecasts have been almost exclusively driven by improvements in observations and in modeling systems. So the initial forecasters that didn't think that there was much value in the modeling were proven wrong. You have me heard me say just a few minutes ago that I don't believe that artificial intelligence will be able to replace modeling. Well, I am now one of the people of the established community that grew up with modeling. It is up to you to prove me that I was wrong. Perhaps AI can be much better than I think and much more of an impact for our forecasters. And it's up to you, the next generation, to prove that to me. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate the opportunity I have to, 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 to talk to you. I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you.